The audition is the job. That is the job. Let's say you get a call right now from your agent mm -hmm. and uh, you have a big audition tomorrow. What's the call like? What happens? Well, uh, what, I'm not sure. What's the, well, first of all, I don't get a call. I get an email. Ah, okay. So yes. it's, not, it's not ring, ring? No, and then... there's none of that anymore. It's all impersonal, I'm, okay. I'm afraid. Um, interesting because now you have to self-tape everything. So it's not like, oh, I have this audition. I'm going to go to Warner Brothers at 4 o'clock to this building, to this room. That, that doesn't happen anymore. I don't know if that will ever happen again. So you have to not only think, okay, I have to look at this. I also, in my case, and I don't know if everyone's like this, I, I go, do I want to do this? Is this something I really want to do? Because I don't care anymore. And I'm, I'm in a different place in my life. If I don't want to do it or if it doesn't feel right, I'll go, I'm going to pass on that. And they seem to be okay with that. But the first thing I do is that I freak out a little bit because I know there's a timeline. And I know that, oh, I have to drop everything and I have to get this done. Now, I don't tape at home because I'm not good at it. And I hire that out. I have a guy I go to. I pay him whatever it is, 40, 50 bucks. He does it. It's great. And I don't have to worry about that because that would drive me crazy. I'm not really good at that. So then I just really have to think about uh, what is this? How do I do this? How do I get off book for this? The timelines, as I said earlier, are very short. So I really have to decide whether I want to do it. When I was producing um, the pilot I produced this summer, I'm on set. We're out in San Dimas. It's like 105 degrees. So hot. And I get an email with a 14-page audition that was due the next day. I just said two things. I said, first of all, thank you. Second of all, can't be done uh, because I'm producing this thing and I'm on set. And lastly, I'm not sure 14 pages can be done in 24 hours anyway, but it won't be a problem because I can't do this one. So it's, it's different. Everybody's, um, the audition is the job. That is the job. And that's the way I try to, teach actors to look at it. You have a job. It's this audition. You have to get it filmed. You have to turn it in. That's the job. Now, you may that job may continue. You may get a call and say, oh, we want, then you may get a chance to earn some money doing that job. But the audition is the job. And, and it's, um, there's not a lot of room for error, I'm afraid. I mean, it's just, it's so, I think because now they're, I think, and I don't know if casting directors will get angry with me, but it's the only people who's not tired of Zoom are the casting people. So they, they if, if they were going to have, see, 30 people in their office on a Wednesday, well, they don't need that extra room. They might not need that extra assistant because they're going to see more than 30 people because they just send out these tapes. And I don't know if they watch all of them. I don't know. Some of them say they do, and I believe that, but some probably don't. Do you think in some ways, though, the self-taping is easier in that you don't have to get in your car yes. or take the bus or Uber or yep. Lyft? It's easier in that respect. It's also easier. It's not easier for me because I'm old and I'm set in my ways and I don't like it, but that's immaterial. It's easier for the, the, the digital natives, the young people who never knew a life without a phone or a camera, um, and are really skilled at it, many of them very skilled, it's kind of easier for them because they can do the audition until they get it the way they want it. In the old days, you'd walk into the room and you might not, your first take might not be good and that may be all you get. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. And you walk out and you do, the, you do your best job in the car on the way home. So yes, that aspect of it is in some ways an improvement. But what's missing is the human element. You don't meet people. You don't, it's all on that little box. Then you're also not dealing with a sea of agendas and energies around you. True. Yeah. I mean, I think it's generational. People my age, uh, I don't particularly like it. I'll, I do it and I do a good job with it. And I understand that how it has to be done. And, um, but you also like, you send it off into the ether and you generally hear nothing, nothing. 
And so you don't even get an attaboy or a good, <laughs> you, you know, not that we all need a pat on the back, but um, sometimes you know, like when you go in and you meet someone in person and you do a really good job with your audition, you may not get that role, but you may get something from that office because they liked you. If they didn't even see that, I mean, they may watch all the tapes, but they maybe only watch 30 seconds and go, no, that, no, wrong, wrong person, wrong whatever. So I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd actually like to know. I'd like to be a fly on the wall of some of those offices and see what they do. And so I know because we hired a very good casting director for the pilot we did, and they did an incredible job. But they're also one of the better, they've been around a long time, and they're one of the better uh, casting offices. So I think it's like anything. There's, there's, there's the cream, and then there's everything else. What do you think of people posting their audition tape online as part of their social media? I don't like it. Do you think it breaks sort of a code? That's an interesting question. Um, well, first of all, sometimes there are shows that are non-disclosures, so they're, they haven't even aired yet. Or sometimes they will send you what we call dummy sides. Do you know what that is? I don't, but... So dummy sides will be like you're auditioning for this character and they'll say these this isn't really the script but it's a, it, it's sides that are like that character and you you have no choice but to just play what you're given you know but I, now i posting people post way too much online about everything but I, I i don't know that's a really good question everyone you know a lot of people just want to be seen and want to present their best life in that way and i don't know i don't think it's a good i don't probably think it's a good idea you know particularly if uh, uh, I, I know people who do that a lot actually now that I think of it I would never do that yeah I was just wondering how casting directors think of it if it's know. not embargoed good... or whatever yeah well if it's embargoed obviously you should never do that but um, I, there's a guy that I know who's a very good actor he's working quite a bit he also as a as a side gig does taping for people and I've actually taped with him and he's great and he did this thing I thought was really cool because he booked some job on a, sh on a show, I don't know, a guest star role of some sort. And he took his audition tape and intercut it with the actual footage from the show to see, show you, this is what I did in this scene. Here's the scene as it was filmed. And I thought that was actually very instructive and cool. But that was also done, the show was, had already been aired. He had access to that footage, theoretically, I guess. And that was actually very teachable and instructive to see what he did that got that role and how it looked when it was filmed. That's kind of interesting. But yeah, posting just in general, people are crazy with that stuff. When you do get this person to film your self-tape, mm -hmm. um, are you there reading lines off of them or they're just an eye line to you? Uh, the place that I use, he's, a, he's an actor himself and he's very good. And so he is the eye line. I mean, now, now we're getting technical, but that's good. Uh, sometimes in, a, in an audition, you might have three people you're talking to, and the eye lines get a little crazy. Like, so I often say just like pick two. Get, have, two <laughs> have two eye lines, other, or unless somebody's in the back and you can talk to someone back there, that's different. But yeah, no, that guy would read with me and... Uh, He's actually quite good, and he will coach a little bit, I mean, which I appreciate. He doesn't overstep, but I think that's smart. Most people don't do that. They just, they just, you know, set up the camera and go. But, uh, yeah, no, he'll, he'll read with me. He's, a very, he's very good at it, so I think it's, tech. you know, the technical stuff is really important, the eye lines and all that stuff. It's just key. And props. They always tell you, don't bring props. I said, bring a prop if it helps you. I, I worked with somebody yesterday. She's playing a bartender. And so she had glasses and she had a rag she threw over her shoulder. I said, that all helps. There's nothing wrong with that. But they used to say, no, you can't do that. All these rules are very fluid now. Right? What does it mean for an actor to make bold choices with their character? I mean, that, that is a cliche, let's say. Make a bold choice, make a strong choice. But with every cliche, there generally is a grain of truth or it wouldn't have become a cliche. Um, 
I think that it's like um, if you're at the top of a mountain and you pour some water down the mountain, it's going to go, it's going to find its way down. That's the obvious way. That is the way down. The water is going to find it little rivulets and it's going to flow a certain way. And most scenes, particularly if you don't have a lot of time, you're just going to play it down the middle because you don't have time to really explore it and get deeper with it. I, I think trying to make the less obvious choice, the, the choice that may not be actually on the page, you have to understand who the end user is. The end user is the casting director and they're looking at lots of tapes. and They're looking at lots of versions of the same scene over and over and over again. And most people, because of either lack of imagination or lack of time, are going to kind of play it the same way. So if you can find a way that's justified, that's earned, where you can play something a little bit off to the side of the page, not down the middle of the page, that's what I would call a bold choice and a smart choice. You don't want to do that just to be different. It has to be earned and it has to feel like it has some fidelity to the character and the story. But I think that's, um, that's how I would define what a bold choice is, something that does not go down the middle. Because most of the time, as I said, lack of time, lack of imagination, and they're watching all these tapes. They're all, we did that when I cast the pilot. I mean, a lot of the tapes were like, they're all kind of play it the same way. And the, the one person who may play it a little differently jumps out for whatever reason. Maybe it's not smart, maybe it's not right, but it's different. And so it's a little like, um, I like sports analogies. Um, like in baseball, the great Warren Spahn, the winning, winningest left-hander in the history of baseball, said that the pitcher's job is to upset the hitter's timing, and the hitter's job is to upset the pitcher's timing. So I think that our job is to sort of break open the timing of that scene a little bit, change the rhythm of it a little bit, if you can find a way to do that, because they're going to hear it a certain way every time, over and over again. If you can find a way to creatively and smartly break up the rhythm. I'm, I've, words and rhythm, very important to me in my own work and, and when, I, when I teach and when I coach. So that's what I would say would be a bold choice. Let's say you've already booked the job. Now you're on set. How bold do you get or no, that breaks, that, that disturbs the other actor in the scene. Right. You're upstaging someone. That's really case by case basis. It depends on the set. If you have a really loose improvisational set, you can do that, you can try that. I, I worked on Curb Your Enthusiasm where there's no script, basically. There's a story, there's a, there are scenes, and so uh, everyone's, you know, a lot of funny people. Larry David, uh, Ed Begley, Richard Lewis, Jeff Garland, you know, they're all gonna try out stuff that's funny and some of it will hit and some of it won't hit. That's an extreme example of where you can be bold and try something else. That's great. I don't think we're going to use that. Uh, but it just is different on a on a on a show that is a well-oiled machine, a weekly kind of what I call factory television. Those those shows that just go week to week. They have a template, a visual template and a tone template that is is established. That's what they do. They play to that. They have like if you watch. Uh, SWAT, every seven minutes someone's going down a hallway with a gun in the dark. I mean that's part of the template. I'm exaggerating but not that much. So you have to understand that and you can't on a show that has a really strong uh, template, you kind of can't do that. It just depends on the circumstance. But it's fun to play and it's fun to do stuff that's different and out there but you just have to kind of know your audience and know what world you're in. <laughs>